All righty. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, we see here, this is the second epistle that, that, the, uh, that the Apostle Paul has written unto Timothy. Timothy was a younger man in the faith. He was a, a, an elder. He was sent to, to start churches and appoint elders and stuff. And he's kind of wrapping it up in his second epistle. And he starts off in the chapter, you know, char giving Timothy his charges and saying that you need to preach the word. You need to preach the Bible, whether it's popular, whether it's not popular. You know, your job is just to preach God's word. And it's a very important job. And he says, he's warning him. He says, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. So there's going to be a time, Timothy, that people aren't going to want to hear the Bible. But you need to preach it anyways. You need to be instant in season and out of season. You need to reprove. You need to rebuke. You need to exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. You need to do these things, Timothy, and keep the faith and be strong for the Lord. And this is what he's admonishing him with. And this, is going, this comes into play with what I'm preaching about today because it's not exactly on this. This is a little bit of an introduction. Jump down, if you would, to verse number um, 9. Look at verse number 9. Paul's kind of recapping a lot of different things that are going on. And he's, try, you know, he's telling them to, to greet people. And he's just, he's just kind of saying all these different things are going on. But look at verse number 9. The Bible reads, Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me. For Demas hath forsaken me having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica, Crescens to Gal Galatia, Titus unto Dalmatia. He's talking about all these people who are fellow workers and laborers with them in the gospel. They've all departed from him. He says, you know, Demas has forsaken me. He's gone. He took off. And, you know, that's why he's saying, do your diligence to come to me shortly. He's like, I need, I need you here. I need somebody here with me. Demas is gone. Crescens is gone. Titus is gone. They've all gone these different places. He says, only Luke is with me. In verse 11, take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. And Tychicus have I sent to Ephesus. The cloak that I left at Troas with Carpus, when thou comest, bring with thee. And the books, but especially the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. Of whom be thou where also, for he hath greatly withstood our words. So he starts off telling Timothy, you know, I need you, well not starts off, but in verse 9 there where we're reading, he's telling Timothy, look, I need you to come here because all these other guys have left me. They've forsaken me. They've gone. They've gone and done this other work or they've just, they've just forsaken me altogether and just, and just got caught up with the cares of this world. Whatever it is that's getting these people out. You know, and then there's a couple other people he sent away to do work. <coughs> Paul needs some reinforcement. He needs some help. And he's telling him here now about this man, Alexander the coppersmith. He's like, this guy did me evil. Watch out for him. Be aware of this guy. He says the Lord reward him according to his works. And he's telling him, you know, you beware too because he has greatly withstood our words. So not only is this coppersmith, it's, it's not just, it doesn't sound like it's just some business deal that's gone bad. You know, it's not like, oh, he stole for something from me. Because it says he's withstood our words. He sounds like here he's an adversary to the gospel of Christ. He's, he's withstanding their words. And what are his words meaning? What's he going to be talking about there? He's not going to be talking about his tent making business. We're saying they're withstanding our words. That means he's, he's, basically being an adversary and going against the preaching of the gospel. And look at what he says here in verse 16. He says, At my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. He says, At my first answer, and, and you know, he's, he's, he's bringing this up right after he mentions the, um, Alexander the coppersmith. And it sounds to me like this guy has come out against him and against what he's doing, and a lot of people might have gotten scared and kind of and kind of backed down, and Paul was left the only one having to stand up for the truth and be in there to as a voice to proclaim against Alexander and against the heresies and, and proclaiming God's word. And he says, At my first answer, no man stood with me. All men forsook me. And what I'm going to be preaching about tonight, the whole subject and, and topic of the sermon, is when all forsake you. Because he started off warning Timothy about this, saying, hey, look, in the last times, 
You know, the perilous times are going to come, and he's saying, you know, people are going to want to just heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. They're not going to want to hear the Word of God, but it's your job to preach it anyways. Whether or not people want to hear it, it's the truth. It's from the Bible. It needs to be heard, and you need to do your job. Take her out, please. Deal with her. Earlier, he mentioned only Luke is with me. And he says, here at my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. But look what he says in verse 17, notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. So that, you know, we ought to be able to rely on our friends. We ought to be able to have people with you, other brothers and sisters in Christ, other people that are going to be there and standing with you so that when you make a bold stand for God, when you preach things that aren't popular, you're going to have people there backing you up and not running away and fleeing when the adversary comes against you and, and threatens you or, or persecutes you the way that they're going to do. Instead of everyone just fleeing away and running away, they ought to be there to provide you with strength. But Paul says here, you know what? Even though everybody left me, notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and he strengthened me. That by me, the preaching might be fully known. He's saying, at least I stood up. At least I was there to preach the gospel and to make it fully known. Everyone else might have run away, but I stood and did it because God strengthened me. And that all the Gentiles might hear, and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. And see, you'll notice this as a common thread in the Bible. When people stand up for God and stand up for the truth and don't care about the consequences and don't be afraid and don't run away and don't let that shut them up like all these other men forsake him, when the man of God just stands firm and stands tall, look, God can deliver you out of the mouth of the lion. He did that here with the Apostle Paul. He did that with Daniel. He did that with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And over and over again throughout the Bible, you find when people make that stand, regardless of consequences, God can deliver you. God can strengthen you. And God is very, very pleased to see his servants not backing down, not getting pushed around, not letting the Alexander the coppersmiths of this world you know, say things against them and withstand your words, but just... just preaching back in full force and not letting the world and, and the people that have itching ears tell you to shut up and tell you to be quiet and tell you not to preach that way. The reason why this sermon is important is because there may be a time in your life when everybody forsakes you. There may be something that happens where it seems like you don't have any friends backing you up. And it's all going to be based upon what you believe because you believe the Bible. Now, God forbid that would happen. I, you know, we don't want that to happen, but look, it's happened to great men. It happened to the Apostle Paul. It even happened to Jesus Christ. We'll, of course, we'll get to that. There's many examples of people being forsaken in the Bible. The more of a righteous life, the more of a godly life that you start to lead, and the more you talk about it, and it's open about it. And it becomes literally a part of your life. Following the Bible and living a life this way, the more it becomes your way of life, the more you can expect to have people persecute you. The more opposition you're going to face because it's going to, you know, it's going to draw attention after a while. People are going to realize... Hey, wait, you don't do the things that we do for fun. You, you aren't going out to the bar. You aren't going out to the movies. You, you know, why, why are you doing this? You, you know, why are you homeschooling your kids? Why, does, why don't you go to work? Why doesn't the wife go to work? Why, why are all these things happening? Why? Because we believe the Bible. Because we believe that God has called us to be a peculiar people and that we are zealous and we want to serve God to the T. We want to serve Him to a letter. We want to look at the Bible and say, this is what God has planned for us as men, as women, as families, as Christians, and do all this work. Why, do you, why don't you just spend your time you know, laying around by the pool on a, on a warm Saturday afternoon and, and, just, and just waste the day and listen to worldly music and just... And just Enjoy yourself. Why are you going out and knocking on doors and preaching and doing all this stuff? Look, because that's what we need to do because that's what's important. I don't want my life just to be vanity. But here's the thing. As you start to do these things and you have these, you, you change your priority levels and say, you know what? God actually is number one. And church is important. And soul winning is important. And fellowship is important. And, and reaching out to other people is important. And visiting the homeless is important. And visiting those in prison is important. And visiting the widows is important. And doing this work is important. 
It's going to be noticed by the world. People are going to take notice of that and pay attention to that. And then the attacks are going to start to come. You can expect to have your friends turn their backs on you. It'll happen. You can even expect to see some Christians turn their backs on you. Hopefully not all, but it, it, it happens. There's some, oftentimes there's weak Christians that, that, you know, they're saved. But when, when the hard times come, they fold under the pressure and they'll even turn their back. And that's what happened to Paul here. Paul said, look, you know, Demas has forsaken me. He's gone. He's not standing with me. These hard times came with Alexander and I got nobody here with me. But praise God, at least God's here with me. God is strengthening with me, but no, everyone else is gone. The hard times came, and where is everybody? Flip back, if you would, to chapter 3, 2 Timothy chapter 3. Look at verse number 8. The Bible reads, Now as Jannes and Jambres withstood Moses... So do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. Now this is, this is interesting too because he uses the same term, withstood. Jannes and Jambres withstood Moses just as Alexander the coppersmith withstood their words. Right? He's an adversary. Just as Jannes and Jambres were adversaries unto Moses. And notice what he's talking about here. He says they're men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. It means they are rejected of God. They are these reprobates, wicked doers that don't love God, that want to have nothing to do with God. They're haters of God and they're against all that is good and all that is holy and all that is righteous. And these people withstood Moses. But look at what it says in verse 9, but they shall proceed no further for their folly shall be manifest unto all men as theirs also was. These people, these reprobates that will come and resist the truth and try to attack you, saying they're not going to make it that far. Their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as theirs also was. Verse 10, But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, basically everywhere he goes, he's saying, look, you know my doctrine, you know my manner of life, you know my purpose, you know my faith, you know my long-suffering because it's part of my life, because it's who I am, and you know the things that I do because they're apparent and everybody can see them. You know what I'm all about. And you also know the persecutions and the afflictions that I face in every city that I went to because this is who I am, because this is what I do, because I'm preaching the truth from the Bible. I'm preaching God's Word. He says, well, persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. So important not to fear. Look, the reprobate is going to come and stand against you. They're going to withstand your words because they hate God's word. They can't stand it. It drives them mad to hear the Bible. They want to have nothing to do with it. It gets them angry and they will persecute you and afflict you and try to destroy you. It's happened to so many, it's happened to people I know, people who are actually standing up and fighting for the word of God, where they've gone after and tried to destroy their business and, and send death threats and, and threaten their children and threaten their families and threaten anyone that, that comes into contact with them and all the death threats and everything else that goes along with it. Look, they're going to withstand you, but you can't be afraid because God is more powerful than any reprobate. Verse 12, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. The persecution will come if you're living godly. It doesn't say for every believer persecution is going to come. It says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus. Not only those that believe on Him, but those that are actually walking the walk and trying to live a godly life. Because when you're actually doing that, you're making a difference. You're going to be making a difference in other people's lives too. And that's when the attacks are going to come. All that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. So the, the reprobates are going to get worse and worse. You need to get better and better and more godly and just understand that the persecutions are going to come. And understand also that when the heat comes down, there may be a lot of people that forsake you. And that we ultimately have to be relying on the strength of God and not completely relying on the people around us. 
The louder you proclaim the truth and the brighter your light shines, the more the heathen is going to rage and the reprobate's going to attack. There's so many once fundamental Baptist churches used to be really fundamental, used to be hard preaching, used to be hard on sin, used to proclaim the truth unadulterated. And they're failing these days. Why? Because they compromise. They've lost the hard preaching. They've lost just, just preaching you the truth. They've compromised with the world. The preaching's gone soft because this world has corrupted the minds of the preachers to start going soft on sin and to not really telling it like it is in the Bible, but kind of watering it down, toning it down a little bit and making it more palatable so that more people want to come and listen and be a part of it. Look, if the world's going to hell, let the world go to hell. You need to just preach the word. So it says, be instant in season and out season. See, it used to be in season. A lot of the things that are preached today that sound radical and extreme, that was in season 40, 50 years ago. No big deal. No one had a problem with preaching against the sodomites 50 years ago. Wasn't an issue. Because everybody thought that was, no. yeah, of course they're weirdos. Of course they're sick. Of course that's perverted. Of course they're pedophiles. Wasn't a big deal. But now, now I'm nuts. According to the world. But as the times change, there's too many of these churches that have changed with it. But here's why they're failing. It's because they're trying to be more in tune with the world. And see, the world wants to have nothing to do with church anyways. They're going to hound on you for, for, for being so extreme. But just because you know, you're that extreme, you could think, oh, okay, well, we'll, we'll tone it down a little bit, and then, and then you could come on in, and then, and then you'll be welcome here. No, they're not going to be satisfied with that because they want to have nothing to do with God anyways. The world at large doesn't want to have anything to do with God. So regardless of, of you toning it down, look, you might as well just keep it real. Nobody likes a compromiser. No one has any respect for a hypocrite. No one has any respect for people. That's why all the time, you know, these celebrities and these people come out and they'll, and they'll actually speak their mind. They'll speak the truth and say, yeah, you know what? I, don't, I think these homos are weird. I don't want to have anything to do with them. I don't want them changing with me in the locker room. I don't want, you know, I want to have nothing to do with them. And then you find out later, you know, because in there, they're just speaking their mind and telling the truth. But then later on, of course, the sodomites come after them. They get withstood and, these, and the, the haters of God will go after these people and then get them to recant and, and say, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I didn't mean that. And they backpedal. And, and look, when you do that, after you've made a bold statement, nobody has any respect for you. The people who are just at the first were like, yeah, right on, man, good. Yeah, you tell them because that is weird. That is sick. That is perverted. Now those people are like, oh, man, what are you doing? Why are you caving in? You have nothing to do with you just as much as the other sodomites in the rest of the world that thought that you were bad to begin with. They don't think you're any better just because you apologized. They just impose their will on you like a bully. Just say, well, yeah, we made him do that, they have, but they don't care about you. So now you've got people hating you from all directions because you compromised. And that's what's happening in the churches. These preachers are compromising and not just telling it like it is and just say, you know what? The people who are interested in the truth, the people who love God, the people who want to hear this stuff, they're going to love it because I'm just going to give it to them the way it is. And the people that don't like it, well, they're not going to like it anyways. Whether you water it down or not, they're just still not going to like it. And I don't know about you, but I want this church to be filled with people that love God and want to serve God and just want to know the truth. Amen. That's why we're Word of Truth Baptist Church, because we love the truth. And the people know it. When you're sitting in a, in a compromising church, at least the people that are, that are going home and reading their Bible... It doesn't take a, a Bible expert or a Bible scholar or a theologian to, to be able to see that with all the, the, the various hot topics that are going on today, you know, the, the, the politically correct or politically incorrect things that are going on, to see where the Bible or God stands on these issues. You read through the Bible cover to cover one time, and you can see where the, where the Bible... It doesn't, it doesn't require in-depth studies into these subjects to see that God thinks that homosexuality is an abomination. It doesn't take in-depth studies to see all the wickedness that's going on in this world. So when 
the person in the pew is reading their Bible and seeing this stuff, and they're saying, yeah, wow, the Bible says all this, and the preacher's not even touching on it. As, as the, the, the freaks are, are parading and being pumped down your throat by the media that, oh, this is normal. Oh, people who want to change their gender is normal. Oh, you need to accept this. Oh, you need to be loving. Oh, you need to be caring for them instead of saying they're a freak and a weirdo and that they've got some, some serious problems and no, it's not okay to change your gender because that's the way that God made you and that, that, is, a, that is just a bizarre, wicked invention in the first place to think that you're going to change, physically alter your body to be a, a female or male and, 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 it's, and it's all perverts doing it. And now it's mixed up kids that have perverted parents that are letting them do it. But people can see that and they see that, they're, that they're, the preacher's not saying anything about it. And if it does come up, it's just this, this, oh, well, we love them all anyways. We want them all to come in. That's not what the Bible says. Church is a congregation of like-minded believers. It's for the believers. And these reprobates, these God-haters, the homos, they want to have nothing to do with God. And that's obvious from just the things that they say. But when all this stuff happens, you know, and then, you know, the people, the people can see that that happens. And then you have the preachers, they start making excuses for God's word because they're afraid of the, of the raging heathen. And you know what they are? They're ashamed. Look at chapter 1 of 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 1 says, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. God has not given us the spirit of fear. God gives us power. God gives us love and God gives us a sound mind, a rational, sound mind to be able to understand and discern right from wrong. God gives us power when you don't have nothing to be afraid of. Nothing. We've got the truth. On, if you're doing what's right, you've got the truth on your side. You've got God on your side. No reason to be afraid. And look at verse 8. He says, but be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. Don't be ashamed of it. Don't be ashamed to talk about Jesus Christ. Don't be embarrassed about it. Don't, don't feel like, oh man, I don't want to say anything about Jesus. Look, don't be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. He says, nor of me his prisoner. And you know what happens? Oftentimes, you know, righteous men of God will get thrown into prison. They'll get attacked. They'll get attacked by Satan. They'll get attacked by the reprobates. And they'll get thrown into, into prison because this world is wicked. Because there's too many wicked judges and wicked people out there that are willing to convict innocent, Bible-believing men of God and throw them in jail. But what's the world think? Oh, he's in jail. He's a bad person. I don't want to have anything to do with him now. Because I don't want to look bad because I'm associated with him. And they become ashamed of people like Paul who was put in prison for preaching the gospel of Christ. And shame on you if you're going to be ashamed of someone else because the heat's coming down on them. You need to stand strong and stand with that person, stand with that man of God who's being persecuted and being afflicted. That's why he says, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. Look, you need to be right in there with them. Don't back down. Don't be ashamed of them. When I first heard a preacher, a preacher with integrity, someone who, who not only preached right out of the Bible, but also did his best to live that way. When I first met an individual that did that and would just preach the plain truth from the Bible, I'll be honest with you, it sounded extreme to me. I thought, wow, that's, that's just, that's pretty extreme. Why? Why? Why did it sound extreme? I'll tell you why. Because I hadn't been hearing the, the, the Bible. I've only been hearing what the world has been telling me. I hadn't been in church. I hadn't even been in a watered-down church. But even the watered-down churches, I'm sure it still sounds extreme. But why is it extreme? The Bible hasn't changed. And, I, and I'll tell you what I was hearing was straight out of the Bible, straight out of God's Word, just, just real simple exposition on God's Word and, and what it says. No twisting of Scripture. No doing, doing mental acrobats as you jump from verse to verse. No. 
just simply stating what the Bible says, and, and in, in light of today's world, it sounds really extreme. But see, the Bible hasn't changed. It's the world that's extreme. It's the world that's gone extremely wicked. So now when you hear the other extreme, the actual truth that's just been around forever, now this starts to sound extreme when it's not. It's the, it's the, it's the wickedness of this world that's so far removed from the holiness that's found in the Bible. That's why it sounds extreme. And you know what? I don't even care about the word extreme. It has a negative connotation these days. But look, if something's right, wouldn't you want to be extremely right? I mean, would, wouldn't you want to be as much right as possible? Just, 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 yep, I'm extreme. If that means it's just extremely correct, yes. The Bible's extreme. Okay, yeah, it's extremely right. It's 100% it's truth. That's extreme. It's not only half truth and half lies and 50. Yeah, some of it's good, some of it's bad. No, this is an extreme book. It's extremely right. It's extremely powerful. But even though it was, a, it was some of the things that I heard were a shock to me. A shock to say, whoa, whoa, I've never heard anyone say that before. I loved it. Why did I love it? Because it was the truth. Because I was hearing God's word actually being preached the way that it's meant to be preached because it's, you know, I, I was able to listen to somebody say, yep, this is what it says, call a spade a spade and just read it, look at the black and white letters and just be able to, to, to say it and, and say it with the authority and the power that God has given to his words and rebuke all the wickedness in this world. Now, even though the truth makes a lot of people uncomfortable, for myself, I decided that I would not forsake the man of God that was preaching, preaching the truth. Because in the early days when I first started attending a church where I was able to hear a preacher like that, a lot of people would come after you and, and a lot of people were ridiculing my pastor. A lot of people were ridiculing that man. And, and I stood with him. I would stand up for him. I might be the only one sometimes. But that's what needs to be done and that's what you need to do. It would be a shame if, if someone were to go, oh yeah, the Pastor Burzins, yeah, he's nice, I like him, he's friendly, but you know, he's pretty extreme, he's kind of out there, he's kind of crazy. You know, when people start throwing around words like that, just be like, no, he's not, I don't think he's crazy. Now obviously, do whatever, do what's in your heart, but I'll tell you what, if you think I'm right, if you think what I'm saying is right, if you think the Bible's right, if you think my preaching is right, then, then don't, don't be ashamed of someone who's doing the work of God and just and just kind of close your mouth and be like, oh yeah, he is kind of extreme. He is, you know, and, and just be real. You know, and I don't like, uh, you know, trying to make excuses either, and, and try even just trying to warn people. Well, I'll tell you what, I have to warn you. This is a really extreme church. You may not like it. Look, don't have that type of an attitude. We ought to have the attitude. People are going to love the truth. That's the attitude I had. Hey, when I heard it, I loved it. Was it, did it sound kind of extreme? Yeah, but that, that's not a turn off at all. When, when you actually hear it, it's like, this is great. I love it. And we should be excited about our church and telling other people about it and say, you know, you don't have to give a disclaimer and say, well, watch out because, you know, you might not like it because, you know, it kind of says some things that, you know, no. Let's not be ashamed of like the Apostle Paul who was thrown in prison because of the things that he said. Which, hey, claiming to be friends with somebody that's in prison can be something that sounds shameful, right? Like, oh, wow, you're friends with that guy? I mean, look at how many people turned against Ken Hovind when he went to prison. People have nothing to do with him. Oh, yeah, he went, you know, and, and just start making all kinds of excuses and, and distancing themselves from him and want to have nothing to do with him because he went to prison. Even though it was wrongful. Now, his imprisonment uh, wasn't directly necessarily related to, to, his, to his ministry you know, with, um, with the Lord, but um, I, I believe it was still a result of it. I, I think it was still an attack by Satan. I, you know, I, I don't have any doubt about that. It wasn't necessarily because he was preaching the gospel and that was illegal and they threw him in prison. But he was exposing a lot of, a lot of lies and, and hypocrisy and, and the New World Order agenda and, and all kinds of things that are going on. And, um, 
and of course preaching the, the, the salvation by grace through faith in Jesus Christ and, and doing his work in that way. But, um, you know, you shouldn't be ashamed of people like that when they go to prison. But you should be able to stand with them and don't forsake him. And I'll tell you what, when the heathen rages against people, the heathen can rage pretty hard. I was witness to all kinds of things that went on in our church before I was sent out to pastor with the, you know, with the, the attacks from the news media, you know, people coming and protesting and picketing and all kinds of stuff to try to make people feel ashamed to even go into that church. Because that's what the devil's going to want you to do. And I'd hear it from family members. I'd hear it from friends. Oh, wow, you go to the, that, that's the one on the news, right? That's the one where they preach all that hate and where they you know, hate people and everything else. I can't believe you go that. Yeah, I do. And you know what? I'm happy that I do. I love that church. It's the best church I've ever been to in my entire life. What do you think about that? Instead of being ashamed of the testimony of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Don't forsake people because the pressure comes down. Turn, if you would, to Mark 14. Because, look, this happened to Apostle Paul. It happened to Jesus Christ himself. Great men of God, God in the flesh, Jesus Christ, had to deal with this, with people forsaking him. Mark 14, verse 48 says, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Are you come out as against a thief with swords and with staves to take me? I was daily with you in the temple teaching, and ye took me not, but the scriptures must be fulfilled. This is when he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, and Judas came and betrayed him, and he's saying, look, you're coming out with swords now to, to, to arrest me? He says, I was with you every day in the temple. I was right out in public. Why didn't you arrest me then? But now you're coming in the middle of the night to take me with your weapons drawn as if I'm some kind of terrorist or something? And what happened? Verse 50, And they all forsook him and fled. Pretty scary event. You got all these, these police showing up with their weapons drawn and they're ready, you know, and they're ready to get Jesus. All of his disciples left him. They all ran away. Not one of them stood with him. Verse 51 reads, And there followed with him, or there followed him a certain young man having a linen cloth cast about his naked body. And the young men laid hold on him. And he left the linen cloth and fled from them naked. It's not in there by coincidence. Nakedness is always associated with shame in the Bible. When, when, when your nakedness is exposed, it's a shame. And what that's illustrating there is the shame that, that, that these men had for, for forsaking Jesus Christ. Hey, they laid hold on him. He could have been like, well, you're taking me too because I'm with Jesus. I support Jesus Christ and his teaching. And if you're going to arrest him, then you can arrest me too. Because everything he says, I believe. Nope, everybody took off. They didn't want to get arrested. They let the heat all fall upon Jesus Christ. Now we know that these things had to happen. We know that scripture was fulfilled. But it doesn't change what's right and wrong and what we, the way we ought to act. And this man, that when they laid hold on him and he took off, he's like, keep my garment, I'm getting out of here. It's a shame. He left off naked, running, scared. Now, if Jesus was forsaken, don't you think that it might be able to happen to you? I mean, he was perfect. He did everything right. He knew what he was doing. If that happened to him, that could happen to anybody. But the good news is this. Because there is good news. Even if, even if all men forsake you, God will not forsake you. We've already seen that in the other passage. Look at, or I'll just read for you from some of these verses. Um, turn, if you would, to uh, Psalm 22. Psalm 22. I'm just going to read some of these verses for you that talk about God never forsaking you. Great encouraging words. Hebrews 13, 5. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he hath said... I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. It's a promise of God. I'll never leave you or forsake you. Deuteronomy 4, verse 30. When thou art in tribulation, tribulation is troubles and trials. When thou art in tribulation and all these things are come upon thee, even in the latter days, if thou turn to the Lord thy God and shalt be obedient unto his voice, for the Lord thy God is a merciful God, he will not forsake thee. 
Neither destroy thee, nor forget the covenant of thy fathers, which he swear unto them. And here we see a condition. He's saying, look, if you turn unto God, if you're going to be obedient to God, he'll, he won't, he's not going to leave you, leave you hang out to dry. You need to stand for him, though. You need to make the right choice. You need to make the stand for Christ. You need to make the stand for God, for his word. He'll never forsake you if you do that. If you're obedient to his words. He said, he'll never forsake you. Uh, Deuteronomy 31, 6 reads, Be strong and of good courage. Fear not, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord thy God, he it is that doth go with thee. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Don't be scared. God is not going to run away. God's not going to leave you out there. God will not fail you. God is able to overcome anybody. And he's not going to forsake you. He won't leave you, is what that's saying. He keeps reading, And Moses called unto Joshua and said unto him in the sight of all Israel, Be strong and of a good courage, for thou must go with this people into the land which the Lord hath sworn unto their fathers to give them. And thou shalt cause them to inherit it. And the Lord, he it is that doth go before thee, he will be with thee, he will not fail thee, neither forsake thee. Fear not, neither be dismayed. Same words repeated. He's not going to fail you. He's not going to forsake you. Don't be afraid of them. Don't fear. God's with you. Psalm 22. Because be, being forsaken, though, it's not, it's not a place you want to be, obviously. It's not, it's not a fun place to be. And the reason why we're going to look at this, we're going to see from the perspective of Jesus Christ when he was forsaken. Because ultimately, Jesus Christ was forsaken even by God. When Jesus Christ was nailed to the cross and he bare the sins of the whole world in his own body, our sins, God forsook him. God left him off to pay the punishment for our sins when he died up on that cross and his soul descended into hell for three days and three nights. He was forsaken for that time. And Psalm 22 gives us insight into Jesus Christ being forsaken. And the reason why I'm going into this is because when you understand what it's like to be forsaken, when you can see what it feels like to go through that and to be all alone, hopefully you won't forsake the man of God when this attack and this persecution and this affliction comes on him. And you have more more respect for that and, and to stick with people as, as opposed to be ashamed and, and distance yourself from them. Psalm 22, look at verse number 1. The Bible reads, To the chief musician upon Ijeth, here, let's see, um, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? These are the words that Jesus Christ spake when he was up on the cross. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? <clears throat> oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not. And in the night season, am not, and I'm not silent. It's just hopelessness. It's a feeling of despair. Where are you, God? You're not hearing me. I'm calling out to you, and you're not there. Why are you so far from help me? Verse 3, But thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in thee. They trusted, and thou didst deliver them. They cried unto thee, and were delivered. They trusted in thee, and were not confounded. Look what he says here in verse 6. But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised of the people. This is what Jesus Christ went through when he was forsaken by God. Um, in, in the New Testament where, it, where this um, is prophesied, this, this prophecy of Jesus Christ's crucifixion, Mark 15, 34 says, And at the ninth hour Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is being interpreted, My God, my God. Why hast thou forsaken me? Making the reference to Psalm 22, or actually the fulfillment of Psalm 22 in that event of God forsaking Jesus Christ up on the cross because he was bearing the sins of the whole world and needed to pay the punishment for it. Turn, if you would, to Psalm 27. You're in Psalm 22, just a few a page or two over, Psalm 27. Because we can take comfort in the fact that God will always be with us. No matter what, even if all men do forsake you, God is with us. God's there to strengthen us and God's there to fight our battles. Paul, the Apostle Paul, hey, even though everybody forsook him, he was there, he was able to find strength in the Lord. We need to remember that God's there and that God has this strength, though. 
so that you don't quit. Because ultimately, that's the plan of the devil anyways. He's going to attack you and reproach you and try to get you to quit. Try to get you out of the fight. And one of the ways he'll do that is try to make everybody forsake you and make you feel all alone. Because it's hard to do stuff when you're all alone. The more people you get, you know, a lot of people go, I hear this over and over again, um, and, and I know this to be true, at least for myself, just doing physical workouts, just, just going and, and you know, running or swimming or lifting weights or whatever, it's always easier when you go with other people. Because you know, okay, well they're relying on me, I need to be there, I'm going to be there to help them out. So you have more of an obligation to go and do things than it is just to go all by yourself and start doing things. When you go out soul winning, I'll tell you what, it's difficult to take it upon yourself and just say, I'm going to go out soul winning and no one else is going with me, I'm just going to go out and do it. It's a lot easier to show up at a soul winning time and other people are going to be there and then we can all go out soul winning. <clears throat> so when all men forsake you and no one's standing with you the whole point of that is because Satan wants you out of the fight but we need to remember that God is there with us that we are actually not alone physically speaking you may be alone you may have a lot of people turn against you and it may hurt and it may be you know it, it may hurt your heart and make you sorrowful and make you grievous but God is with you. And He provides the best strength anyways. But you have to have the faith and, and realize that God's there. Look at verse number 1 of Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Whom shall I fear? Who's going to make me afraid? God's my light. God's my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, come upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. This is David talking about how his enemies, God was taking care of them. God was looking out for them. Verse 3, Though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. I mean, remember when Elisha, when the whole armies, the whole host is like the, like, like the sand by the sea were all around him. He wasn't afraid at all. His servant was afraid. Elisha wasn't afraid. He's like, no, they that be with us are more than they be, that be with them because he knew God was protecting him. He didn't have to see, physically see the angels. He didn't have to see them. He knew they were there. He knew God was protecting him because his faith was in God. Verse 4, One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me upon a rock. And now shall mine head be lifted up above mine enemies round about me. Therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing, yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy also upon me and answer me. When thou saidst, Seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, Thy face, Lord, will I seek. So when you told me to seek you, I sought you. I'm right there, doing what you told me to do. Hide not thy face far from me. Verse 9. Put not thy servant away in anger. Thou hast been my help. Leave me not, neither forsake me, O God of my salvation. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. He's saying even when my parents. I mean, you talk about nobody being with you. When your own flesh and blood, when your own parents who are supposed to be with you there for everything because they love you, because they're your parents, when they are gone, God, you're still with me. And you need to be prepared for that. That may, that may happen. There may be a day when even your own flesh and blood forsake you and will have nothing to do with you and are ashamed of you. Rest in God. Trust in his, in his strength. Verse 11, Teach me thy way, O Lord, and lead me in a plain path because of mine enemies. Deliver me not over unto the will of mine enemies, for false witnesses are risen up against me, and such as breathe out cruelty. Look at, look at the attacks that are coming. False witnesses. Hey, people are coming and they're lying about me. Such as breathe out cruelty. The cruel reprobate is, is there, and they don't care about lying about you. 
you know, there may be men of God that are going to, that, that, and this happens too, I'm sure. They get accused of something heinous like pedophilia or adultery or some other thing, and they're completely innocent. But just because they get accused of it, now all of a sudden everyone's like, whoa, and they distance themselves from them, and they're ashamed of them, they will have nothing to do with them. Because, now, if it's true, obviously those are really serious allegations, and you should distance yourself from someone who's doing those types of things. But if it's, you don't know if it's true, oftentimes. And people just throw these slanders. See, they'll, they'll bring false witnesses because they want people to forsake you. They want everyone to get away from you. And that's also why you can't just believe every rumor that's floating around out there either. Because of the people that hate God and hate people of God and hate the work that's being done, there will be a lot of rumors out there. Look, I don't spend very much time, like, I don't have to feel like I, I need to write people that are wrong and people that lie about me. I don't even know everything that's written about me. Maybe there's not very much right now, but I guarantee you after given enough time, there's going to be plenty of stuff out there about me. And there's going to be plenty of false information out there of people just lying because they hate God and they don't like the message and they don't like the Bible being preached. So they're going to try to shut me down by lying about me. It's going to happen. We just need to be aware of that because these are the types of attacks that will happen. It's, we see it plain black and white here. David was talking about it. False witnesses being risen up against him. By the people that breathe out cruelty. They exhale cruelty. Verse 13, I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. If you're doing what's right, if you're living the way that God wants you to be living and you get these attacks and you get these persecutions and everyone seems to be leaving you behind, saying, wait on God. He'll be there to lift you up. He'll be there to protect you. Psalm 37. It's the last place we're going to turn, Psalm 37. I wasn't even going to turn here tonight, but let's just do it. Psalm 37. This fits in actually quite nicely with um, some people we met out soul winning this afternoon, which... Um, Remind me, brother, after service, when I'm done with the sermon, because I promised that we would pray for those people. So don't let me close the service without us praying for, for those people that we met out soul winning. But Psalm 37, look at verse 23. And th these verses just reminded me of them. Psalm 37, verse 23. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Again, this, this, is, this gives us comfort. This is what's going to make see us through any times of trouble that we have. The steps of a good man, if you're doing what's right, a good man, they're ordered by the Lord. God is ordering your steps in front of you. So when the bad things happen, you don't have to worry about it. God is ordering your steps and, and directing you where to go. And he delighteth in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. God is there to pick you up when you fall and you stumble and you have those hard times and people come and attack you. Hey, look, God's right there to help you up. Verse 25, I have been young and now I'm old. Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. He's saying, in all my life, those that are righteous, God doesn't forsake them. God doesn't even let them go begging bread. He'll take care of you. Those that are righteous. He said, it, it's, it's without fail. This happens. And he said, I've seen it with my own eyes. Not one righteous man is out there begging bread. Verse 26. He is ever merciful and lendeth, and his seed is blessed. Depart from evil and do good and dwell forevermore. For the Lord loveth judgment and forsaketh not his saints. They are preserved forever, but the seed of the wicked shall be cut off. Verse 29, The righteous shall inherit the land and dwell therein forever. The mouth of the righteous speaketh wisdom, and his tongue talketh of judgment. The law of his God is in his heart. None of his steps shall slide. The wicked watcheth the righteous and seeketh to slay him. Look, wicked. there are wicked people out there that are looking to slay, to kill the righteous man. They're after him. The heathen, the reprobate, 
the wicked, the, the wolves in sheep's clothing, those types of people, they are out there watching the righteous. They're looking at what they're doing and just waiting and plotting and planning to have their time against them. Verse 33, but look at what it says. The Lord will not leave him in his hand. God's not going to leave you to their devices nor condemn him when he is judged. Wait on the Lord and keep his way and he shall exalt thee to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, thou shalt see it. When you're living righteously, just to recap, when you're living righteously, there's going to be a tax made. When a church starts to grow and is doing what's right and is doing a great work for, for God, the attacks are going to come. The enemy is watching. And if they don't know about us now because we're so small, they're going to they're find out. They're going to find out about what's going on and the lives that are being changed and the people that are being led to Christ. The attacks are going to come. First, don't forsake don't forsake the man that's standing up for God. Don't leave him. Don't, don't, be, the, don't be one of the, like the disciples that turned their back on Christ and left and fled. Don't be like these, these men that, that left Paul and forsook him when he was dealing with Alexander the coppersmith. Don't, don't be like one of them. Just be there for, for the per whoever it is that's being persecuted. I'm not saying it's going to be me, but whoever it is. I'll be there for you. I've proven myself in the past. I'll be there for you when, it, when the attacks come. But even if you get to a point where everybody's forsaken you, just know God does not forsake the righteous. God will be there with you. God can be your strength. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the strength that you give us. We thank you for loving us, for being merciful towards us, dear Lord, and being such a loving Father to, to be able to step in and intercede for us when we need your help. God, we thank you for, for all that you've done for us, Lord, and, and I, we are humbled at your love and mercy and pray that you would please help us just to do the work you have and not to be afraid of what, uh, of what men can do unto us but that we would serve you in truth and in honor. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.